This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, everyone. This is Eric Weber dropping in before this new episode starts to explain that from time to time, we release episodes in our podcast a little bit out of order compared with when they are aired on the radio. We only do that when there's a motivating interest concerning the particular timeliness of the given episode. In this case, we are releasing episode 87 on going to college in the 60s a little bit early because my colleague, Dr. John Thielen, who is our guest in this episode, will be talking about his new book, The the subject of this interview tomorrow, Tuesday, March 5th at 5 p.m. at the Boone Center on the campus of the University of Kentucky. Reach out to me ASAP with any questions or requests concerning the event. You can email me at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com or you can call me and leave a voicemail at 859-257-1849. And if you're in or near Central Kentucky, consider joining us. After John's talk, we'll have a book signing and reception, and FYI, the Society of Philosophers in America, SOFIA, of which Philosophy Bakes Bread is a production, is a proud sponsor of John's talk in the colloquium series of the Department of Educational Policy, Studies, and Evaluation in the College of Education at the University of Kentucky. For more information about our department's programs, visit education.uky.edu slash EPE. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode. everyone, and welcome to Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. Philosophy Bakes Bread is a production of the Society of Philosophers in America, a.k.a. SOFIA. I'm Dr. Eric Thomas Weber. And I'm Dr. Anthony Cascio. A famous phrase says that philosophy bakes no bread, that it's not practical, but we in SOFIA and on this show aim to correct that misperception. Philosophy Bakes Bread airs on WRFL Lexington and is distributed as a podcast next. Listeners can find us online at philosophybakesbread.com, and we hope you'll reach out to us on Twitter at philosophybb, on Facebook at philosophybakesbread, or by email at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. Last but not least, you can always leave us a short recorded message with a question or a comment or even some soft Fluffy, bountiful praise. Eric loves it. We like that. Yeah. yeah. Actually, we've been hearing from a lot of you recently, and it's really just it's just made our hearts happy. All right? And you can reach us at 859-257-1849. That's 859-257-1849. On today's show, we're downright fortunate to be joined by Dr. John Thielen, who is a university research professor in educational policy studies and evaluation at the University of Kentucky. And he's also the author of a recent book, Going to College in the 60s. Thank you for joining us, John. Good to be here. Awesome. We're going we're gonna to name today's episode going to college in the 60s right after your book. Hope that hope, hope you're okay with that. <laughs> that that's, I, I see a trend there. Is we that plagiarism? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so that's right. John is an historian and author of many books, including the widely read and studied A History of American Higher Education. He was honored in 2004 with a Great Teacher Award, and in 2006, he received the University Provost Award for Teaching Excellence. In 2007, the American Educational Research Association conferred on him the Exemplary Research Award on Post-Secondary and Higher Education Research. Congratulations, John. Thank you, Eric. A lot of exemplarity going on. This is fantastic. <laughs> John's further books have included Games Colleges Play, Essential Documents in the History of American Higher Education. That's a sexy title. As well as a textbook on American higher education. John, it's an honor to have you on the program. As I understand it, you're a pretty big deal in American higher education research. Can you want to pat yourself on the back there? I think that sounds... Yeah, yeah we, we're, like we're doing this. There we go. There we are. In every episode, we want to make sure our listeners know a bit about our guests. We take philosophical directives seriously. We need you to know thyself. We think it's important to know thyself. So we want to know, who is John Thielen as a person? Who are you, John? Kind of How, how did you come about becoming who you are today? And how did that kind of maybe merge into your interest in history and American educational history. And so who's John? I see myself as uh, a very fortunate participant observer 
in some of the most incredible decades and years, particularly in American colleges and universities, and also in American culture. And and I through through no planning on my part, I've ended up in being in some interesting places and able to meet and talk to and observe a range of interesting people. And I think this is what I try to convey uh, through my various articles and books. So, John, what are some examples of the interesting places and experiences you've had an opportunity to encounter or have? Well, in an earlier era, <clears throat> since you've all been watching the Super Bowl, as a kid, I used to be able to go down to the field at the Los Angeles Coliseum with a crowd oh, wow. of 90,000 and really get to know many of the players for the Los Angeles Rams and would be a pen pal with them. Same with the, I got to know the Washington Redskins who trained at Occidental College, which is Barack Obama's alma mater. And uh, the owner and equipment manager sent me a jersey from one of their favorite players. And this has followed, I just take an interest in people. And I think this has followed in college and university. We're getting to know people such as the president of the University of California, Clark Kerr. Wow. And just a number of other very, very talented people. And so my role is to observe and to try to write those stories. So you're, 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 uh, you find yourself observing and, and writing about interesting people in interesting times. But I want to go back up and, and, and talk a little bit more about sort of how you kind of chose this sort of life for yourself, right? You know, you're, you're young John. You know, a lot of people live through interesting times and, and observe interesting things, but not everyone decides they're going to sit down and think about it and write about it and tell other people about well, it. What kind I, of- I, 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 have to, I have to acknowledge up front that I'm bi-coastal and, and, and I'm not ashamed. <laughs> and I can walk away from either coast anytime I wish. No, I was born in Boston. However, I grew up much of my life in Los Angeles. Then uh-huh. upon graduating from high school, I went 2,500 miles to Brown University. <laughs> and then after that, uh, I chose graduate school on the basis of weather reports, which, of course, led me back to California, to yes. Berkeley. So the compromise has then, since graduate school, to have been in Virginia and Indiana and in Kentucky. So I kind of split the difference. But I've, I've really enjoyed the regional differences, the institutional differences. It, it leaves me uncertain as to where I best belong, but I have enjoyed each place. Now, John, you mentioned you're bi-coastal. You're not one of these people who thinks that we're living in a flyover state, do you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't call it that, I hope. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 if anything, I think my, my flight has, has been delayed. <laughs> uh, and, and I, th- I think we're, we're here for, for uh, a good stopover. Right on. So, so John, in, in terms of this, this interest in particular times and, and persons and so forth, you know, you came to study history in particular. I mean, you, you know, you could study political science and think about, you know, political figures, or you could study sociology and so forth. What drew you in particular to history? Well, my father was an aerospace engineer and, I did indeed go through the required honors courses in high school, math, and science. But I think on a dare and in part to maybe spite him, I thought I'd go an exact (laughs) 180 degree difference, breaking his heart, so to speak, and and opting for history. Uh, then, Then the challenge was to prove that I still, having done that, was employable. Well, surely he he had the high hopes that you'd become an attorney, right? (laughs) Hey, so soon. engineer. (laughs) <laughs> right. It's, it's every kid's job to break their parents' heart, right? That's kind of so. So your PhD oh, yeah. is in, in in history, John, and and clearly you were you know you were drawn to something in that area. So the the we we often in this first segment ask people who study philosophy, what's philosophy? Well, history is something also kind of difficult to define, and it's it's sort of nebulous. It could be approached in a whole bunch of ways. So I'm going to ask you. What's history? Well, with any good question, I have to draw from my love of rock and roll. And uh, right. the, the late Sam Cooke, who said, don't know much about history. And, and so <laughs> either did I. So I thought I'd at least you know, try to you know, you know, make some progress on that. What happened was I, as an undergraduate, I majored in uh, European history. And you can ask me anything about the 14th century. <laughs> but but decided uh, in graduate school to shift to American history and then ultimately pulling together economics, sociology, public policy, and history to look at the history of education, particularly of higher education. So it has been, a, in retrospect, 
It makes sense, but it was adventurous. And in kindling in, in a lot of this, in studying colleges and universities, my professors were skeptical when I expressed an interest in taking seriously the topic of college sports. And so once again, I took that less as a stop sign and more as a green light. And so I devoted myself to including the serious history of college sports as part of the important story of American higher education. Ah, very good. Well, so I know you were in the College of Education at the University of Kentucky. So I think it's also fair to ask you, what is education? And even more specifically, what is what is higher education? And kind of what drew you to think about American higher education? That seems like a very specific, I, I but that, interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think obviously formal schooling in our, our institutions, which is schools, academies, colleges, universities, uh, those, those are central to the story of education. I, however, I try to take a broader view that just within our, our schools and colleges, the extracurricular activities, and then I would add the, the broader scope of experiences that uh, a young person experiences as they become not so young, all have this cumulative and complex effect of contributing to education. So I do tend to focus on institutions such as colleges and universities, but I try to give them a broad perspective to go beyond the course catalog. So, uh, John, there's a, there's a controversial passage. This is, you know, the show Philosophy Bakes Bread. So we, we think a lot about philosophy. And in particular, there was a passage in Plato's Republic, I think it was, in which he talks about the idea that philosophy as a subject is one really best studied after you've had a life of experiences, right? He thought, in fact, you know, it's probably advisable to study philosophy at the age of 50, he even suggests. My question is essentially, you know, is it a mistake to think about older folks engaging in education and, and studying things like philosophy? Was, was Plato just foolish? Well, let me, let me bypass Plato and, and, and be more provincial. Uh, as Mark Twain said, <laughs> that isn't it too bad that liberal arts education, like youth, is wasted on the young? <laughs> so uh, I, I, I would rather see it as, as a work in progress and you know, you're, you're, you're welcome to hop on the train at any age. And if you get enough incompletes in courses, you certainly can extend that curriculum from age eight, <laughs> 18. Yes. My, actually, my, my goal for some of my students is that at the University of Kentucky, we have a Donovan Scholar Program, which means at the age of 60, you get tuition free. And believe me, some of my graduate students who started studies at age, let's say, 21, they're making good progress toward that goal of 60. <laughs> That's one way to do it, right? Just, yeah, just don't leave. How about that? So, so in, in, in today's episode, in the next two segments, especially, we're going to focus on your new book, John. But, but, you know, we have a big picture question to ask you in general for the purpose of this episode. You know, why study what it was like to go to college in the 60s? Well, the truth can be told. The time seal has been removed. And with the 50th anniversary, I, I've been silent too long. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, in fact... Documents uh, declassified? Yes, decla yes. And I'm <laughs> breaking the silence that I, I think I just became saturated with all the simplistic stereotypes of the decade. Uh -huh. And that I, I just had had a little bit of reservation about writing something that was so close to home, both in terms of, let's say, my own experiences and in terms of time. And I think that 50 years, I mean, you know, if, if we are, you know, baking bread, I, I think it's time to serve. Ooh, I like that. We love our bread metaphors on, on Philosophy oh, Bakes yeah. Bread. All and that is actually metaphors. all the bread metaphors we can get we're, we're yes, game yes. for. And bad ones, too. You know, well, you know, hey, our last episode we called a French toast episode because we were <laughs> reusing old material. It kind of worked, I know, but but the, we, we happen to like these metaphors. Anyway, so that's a perfect place to let folks know that we're going to come back with three more segments with Dr. John Thielen. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. You've been listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber here talking today with Dr. John Thielen, author of Going to College in the 60s. In the second segment of the show, we're going to ask John about the development of crowding and competition in American higher education during the 60s. Then in the next segment, we'll ask him about the you're with us or you're against us ethos that arose at that time same time. Right. So, so John, a big sort of preliminary question is to ask you, you know, how did college change if it did in the 60s in terms of crowding and competition, you know, as, as you've explained to us earlier, and what led to those changes? Well, I know that economists have claimed to the dismal science, but I'm going to borrow from that dreary topic. And part of it was simply that the number of high school graduates coming out of American schools increased dramatically, I guess, in part, the baby boomers, an original term I coined. Um, uh, (laughs) but, but But added to that was this commitment that had come about right after World War II was this vision and hope that America could make college affordable and accessible to a larger percentage of high school graduates. So you had a kind of a, a one, two punch and it meant that that a lot of colleges and universities between 1960 and 1970 literally would double or triple in their enrollments. That's amazing. Wow. Awesome. Well, That's really good. <laughs> double well, and triple it, it, in their enrollments. I'm just trying to, you I, know. I'm sure. Our, I'm sure our, our I, universities I, are having conversations about enrollment and getting it up. Well, that's I'm true. The, like the university the struggling for enrollment would probably be thrilled about yeah. even hearing that idea. But I imagine also there were an awful lot of growing pains and problems and costs yeah. and so forth. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's massive growth very quickly. So what happened? What happened to the colleges? Well, well so... Th- Parents were delighted that their precocious daughters and sons were admitted to college and that it was reasonably affordable. But once enrolled, you find that your dormitory room where you thought you were going to share with Eric, I also had to share with Anthony and also probably with Chad. And so, you know, no four, 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 you know, two, two is company, four was a crowd. But but to find relief from these insufferable roommates, I would go to my introductory course, and there would be 600 other undergraduates. That's amazing. Taking Psych yeah. 101. 600. You, you you can't help but feel like just a number, like one among an enormous herd. Right. Well, yes, and, and and actually, there was one class at, at the University of Wisconsin where that class of six hundred they had actually turned two hundred away. Wow. wow, just a really popular yeah. class. Great What's professor. That? Was it just yeah. a really popular class? Just yes, a great professor. No, 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 it wasn't popular. It was required. If you can't can be popular, be required. <laughs> it's good. So, uh, so you're seeing all these changes in the in the 60s and 70s with, with you know class sizes and going. Maybe maybe it would help us to understand kind of how big of a change it was. Could you tell us a little bit about colleges before this change? Like, what was it? What was the what was life like in college before this change? Who went and who was it for? Interesting. Take, take something like the, the Big Ten universities, the, you know, the, particularly the great state universities of the Midwest. In 1940, I think three or four of the Big Ten had undergraduates enrollments under 8,000. Wow. Now, consider that to where, let's say, by between 1960 and 1970, I think all of the Big Ten universities truly were big, and they would have enrollments from between twenty to forty thousand. That just gives you an idea. Now, you you had a few places, such as say the Ohio State University, <laughs> which I put in italics, and say University of Michigan, and let's say University of California Berkeley. Th- they had been pretty large. They were about fifteen to twenty thousand, but even they would uh, expand. But a place like like University of Virginia in 1940 had about 2,800 undergraduates. Oh, wow. So it just, so there's this kind oh, of quant, quantum leaps. Did you say the university of Virginia had 2,800 undergraduates? I, that's what I said. Yes. I, I'm astonished. It was yes, that small. Yeah. Boy, that takes some doing, but yes. That's yeah. amazing. Wow. Okay. So, so one question, John, is that, you know, when colleges were, were less competitive and less crowded, did that mean that their missions were different, were more open and inviting to all? 
And if that's the case, doesn't competition frustrate those kinds of aims? I, I think that undergraduate life, whether at a state university or at a liberal arts college, traditionally there there had been intensity in the classroom, and there's you know very dedicated teaching and learning. However, the pace of campus life in terms of living and residence and of student activities, it was a more measured, leisurely pace, more likelihood that you would know many of your classmates or that, heaven forbid, kindly faculty would have undergraduates over for like Sunday dinner or something like that. So I I don't want to over romanticize that, but there was a, a scale and a pace that was different. It was less frenetic less intense. And, and what, what one of the byproducts of the crowding was uncertainty in that, that you, you did not know, were you going to get a seat in a particular class? Were you going to get on campus housing? So there, it added to a kind of underlying quiet tension. Well, I, I guess let me let me you know put my question in another way. Think of a, a university like UC Berkeley. It's understood to be an excellent university, but at one point in time, it was considerably less selective, right? It had far fewer applicants, far fewer students. Did did the increase in demand change the missions of these kinds of universities? Yes. Now, what you would find, let's say, at Berkeley in an earlier era you would find more of a state social elite with with a lot of academic talent. The graduate programs were very selective academically. So there was a, a real split ah. between in the pyramid between the undergraduates and the graduate students. Right. But yes, the, the increased numbers and interesting, the, the big gainers in going to college, particularly to academically strong institutions, were graduates of public high schools, and pr- particularly like bright, nerdy guys from big public high schools. And it was an example of where the SAT really identified certain kinds of exceptional talent. And so that suddenly, if you were from Central High in Des Moines and had outstanding grades and a good SAT score, you may well indeed get admitted to Yale over a prep school grad. Uh, so there, there was no, this kind true. of incredible gain, partial gain in terms of merit and talent. And it really extended the net of who was considered, the term they used was college material. That's the best explanation for the value of the SAT I think I might have ever heard, actually. Yeah, but, 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 but remember, I hedged my bets because notice I said <laughs> that, it, it, no, seriously, it, 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 did identify and reward a very talented group, the science-oriented, math-oriented, white male. And yeah. the talent was genuine. And it was, it was quite apart necessarily from like high social class. But that has a shelf life. And, and that, that might have worked very, very well, let's say, in 1960. It does not mean it works well in terms of selecting and sorting in 1990 or in, you know, 2020. That makes a lot of well, sense. Well, that's, that's actually good. And that actually leads to kind of another question we had. We, we, so we have all this growth and change and crowding in the, from the 60s. Did it lead to some unsustainable practices and decisions that college made that and universities made that wouldn't really continue after the wake of the baby boomers? Is that that's been a bubble that was created? Um, I, I think what happened is that the consumerism changed in that if a college admissions office goes from having, let's say, three applicants for two slots, but then in the 60s, it goes to having something like five applicants per slot, right? That gives a great advantage to the institution and to the admissions office. Mm. They, they have the luxury of choice. Now, what will happen by the mid-1970s and later, there is actually a, a tapering of the number of high school graduates. There's been an overexpansion of campuses. And so... Those admissions offices that were were pretty smug in, say, 1965, by 1975, they were working very, very hard to make sure that they could fill their classes with students who, let's hope, had both good grades and could pay tuition. Yeah. A lot of law schools are facing those kinds of problems right now, aren't they? Yes, indeed. And, and, you know, it's funny, de Tocqueville noticed around 1820 that, that there was 
a surplus of lawyers in the United States. <laughs> and, and, and somehow they, they, they kept on coming and they seemed to be, <laughs> you know, more or less gainfully employed, sometimes transferring to state institutions with white collar crime. But nonetheless, but yes, indeed, today it is incredible that finally there seems to have been a saturation. <laughs> well, so in, in recent years or relatively recent years, John, there was, there's been a debate between President Obama and Governor Romney about whether everyone should go to college. And so my question is whether at the time in the 60s, there was somehow similarly some pushing back against the growth in college enrollments, or, or was it thought only desirable? Did it bring with it incre you know, increases in expenses and structural growth costs? And you know, there had to be naysayers, right? The way I would frame it is that John Gardner, who I think is really one of the towering, albeit underappreciated figures in, in American public life, when he was president of the Ford Foundation in the early 1960s, he wrote a book called Excellence. And the subtitle posed this, this fascinating American question, can we be equal and excellent too? And it was a question. And that essentially was the, the proposition that each institution or family or whatever, or state legislature had to at least confront. You know, one resolution was sorting and tracking, because if you look at the, the big addition to American higher education starting in 1960 was the creation and growth of what was first called the junior college, later the, right. the public community college. And so that that accommodating students beyond high school could take many forms. And, and so that it could range from essentially open admission, two-year junior college to the most advanced or exclusive graduate program. So, so I think the American aim was to kind of keep as many students in the game as possible, but that did not preclude sorting and selection. That's good. We, we, we saw these sort of this growth in the 60s. What if any of our sort of problems today, especially in academia, stem from changes to co College of the Rose in the 60s? Uh, I think the, the interesting legacy that's kind of gone on steroids is selective admissions at a handful of very prestigious institutions. So that let us say we, we had an overall increase in competition and crowding between 1960 and 1970. Fast forward to today, where Frank Bruni, the columnist for the New York Times, wrote a wonderful spoof column about two years ago, where Stanford University admissions office decided that even though they had 20 applicants per slot, none of them were really worthy of being admitted to Stanford. <laughs> and it, so that, so that, no, no, and, 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 and they say, that's all right, Heather. You'll you'll be very happy at your safety school, Yale. Ooh. <laughs> so 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 what you're getting is this game on Mount Olympus of what I would say probably fifty colleges or universities, some private, some public, that have this incredible bounty of a lot of applicants and very good applicants, but the the configuration changes drastically as you look beyond those those 50 or 20 colleges that get 90% of the media coverage interesting and and in a sense you know at least potentially it, correct me if i'm wrong isn't one of the challenges that so many other colleges and colleges and universities appear to sort of try to be like those very selective universities even though they themselves are not yeah, and, and in many ways, that's been a good thing. It's, uh, I think uh, oh, okay. da da David Reisman, very, very influential sociologist, compared American higher education to the head of a snake and the tail, and where the, <laughs> the, 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 way, the way that imitation would diffuse. And, and, and in many ways, that, that I think was good in that it prompted and encouraged many colleges to be more energetic, more innovative, to add honors programs, okay. to, to try to acknowledge and reward talent. The, the problem arises, though, when the, that competition you know, can become excessive. And it, what, what happened around 1985, coming out of a terrible extended 15-year recession, American higher education rebounded, and there were about 30 colleges and universities that could do anything they wanted. They had money, they had prestige. And, and Charles Klotfelder of Duke University described what he called buying the best. 
There was mm. there, there there was this group of colleges that if if they chose to emphasize doctoral programs in physics, they could do that. They could get the facilities, they could hire faculty, they could attract top students. Or heaven forbid, if Duke decided that it really wanted to be good in basketball, it could get the best coach, get the best players. Mm-hmm. You could you could mix and match any right. way you wish, but but you had that that rare opportunity where resources were not the obstacle. Hmm. Well, th- we got many more questions that we want to ask you, but fortunately we got two more segments with Dr. John Thielen. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio, and you've been listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. We'll be right back. If you're hearing this, that means podcast advertising works. WRFL is now accepting new applications for advertising in a selection of our original podcast series. If you or someone you know owns a business in Central Kentucky and would be interested in advertising on WRFL's original podcast, please email development at wrfl.fm. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber, and this afternoon we've been having a really wonderful conversation with Dr. John Thielen about his new book, Going to College in the 60s. In the last segment, we talked about the sort of boom of colleges and universities in the 60s. Everyone was graduating, going to college, and there's this incredible growth, incredible crowding, incredible competition in American colleges, and we kind of talked about the after effects of that. In this segment, we're going to talk to John about the attitude of you're with us or you're against us that arose in higher education, especially in the 60s. That's right. So, John, in talking with you about your book, you explained to us earlier that there's a there was a you're with us or you're against us attitude that emerged in higher education in America. What was the culture of higher education like before the 60s, and how did it change into what you've just described? I think prior to 1960, actually really prior to about 1965, most American colleges and universities had a rather benign political atmosphere. There were always some exceptions. For example, I think some of the campuses in New York City in the 1930s, some campuses always had a tradition of political activism and dissent. But I think it was accentuated, starting with UC Berkeley and what was called the free speech movement, starting around 1963, escalating there, and then also spreading so that what we find is like around 1968, 69, really visible, volatile campus protest at Columbia, at Harvard, later on at Wisconsin, Michigan. And it what happened is that it, it politicized campus life. And so that regardless of, of what your views were, whether you were a participant or intense, or whether you were neutral, it, it was pretty hard to escape this kind of battle of persuasion. And I I call it the difference between the university being a marketplace of ideas and becoming more of a marketplace of ideologies. And so Ooh. so so the polemics of like to take a stand That needs to go on a t-shirt, John, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's far out, Eric. <laughs> um, and so the the it, it kind of ratcheted up the the temperature and the volume and the intensity of awareness of social issues, civil rights, politics, but but it diffused at different rates, you know, through different regions, different kinds of colleges or whatever. But but there was also was the, the impact of television, where it was really the first era where you have live broadcast on your evening news and whatever, where suddenly selected campuses became newsworthy. And so for viewers who were far from a college campus would suddenly see demonstrations or sit-ins or students occupying the president's office and so on, it, it increased the visibility and the intensity. And there was this, what I felt was a rather anti-intellectual pressure to take sides and which to, to me as a, a, 
I consider myself a reasonable sort. My only flaw is modesty. I, I, I felt very threatened by that pressure to, to choose between two extreme sides of an argument or of a cause. So just a, just a real quick clarification, right? We're just talking about this, uh, you're with us or against us attitude. This is, the, who is the us here? Is it just like whoever's not? Well, it was whoever, 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 was, asking, whoever was asking the question. So, okay. I mean, so is this going to apply for students, administration, faculty, staff, outside? I mean, is this just kind of? It would, it would, I, I think, I think the, 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 the characters that were originally associated with that would be probably student activists from the far left. Okay. Uh, and, it, and it could involve any range of issues. It could be on where did you stand on the Vietnam War? Where did you stand on anti-poverty programs? Where did you stand on federal money going for weapons research? But, but it, when, you, when you cast down that gauntlet, it by definition creates this fissure or gulf if, if you have us then there has to be them. And so them would then raise their own question. So you you had at very least these competing sides for for the hearts and minds. And, and, and interesting, that was the expression that Lyndon Johnson used in one of his cases where uh, for a politician who never wanted anything to do with Vietnam, he ended up saying, if I can have your hearts, if I can have your minds, we can pursue this war. Well, so there you had from an established politician using the same logic and appeal that, let's say, the Black Panthers or, or the uh, young radicals would use. Interesting. So, so John, I mean, you know, people today, you know, at least there are some scholars out there who, who argue that sort of colleges and universities are under attack, like as, as being sort of bastions of, of, you know, leftist thought or, or, you know, atheism or something like that. And, and they, they think that univer colleges and universities today are, you know, marketplaces of ideologies, just, just one ideology. It, you know, do you think that those kinds of, of, of challenges are basically reminiscences from the 60s or, or is there something new that's developed? I, I think that that terminology or slogan certainly has been airlifted from, let's say, 1968 to, to today. But I, I, I would ask you good naturedly, if, if someone really thinks that university faculty are overwhelmingly stilted toward the left, please go to a faculty meeting in the College of Pharmacy. Uh, <laughs> go, go to the business school. Go to forestry. Economics? Uh, well, yeah, but well, I, I, actually economics will, will probably have schools of thought sure. uh, and divisions. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I think usually that, that image of the, the indoctrination to the left, usually I think the, the illusion would be to certain institutions and certain fields, usually in in the liberal arts, but right. I, I I find it woefully exaggerated and, and an unfounded accusation. Hallelujah! Yeah. So, what do you think led to these kind of changes in the '60s? Do you think it was just the overcrowding and the the political tension of the time, or I mean, was it inevitable because there were so many people all suddenly seeking higher education? Was it the type of education that was going on? I, I, I'm not a believer in the idea that history repeats itself. The only thing that repeats itself is someone who fails a history course and has to take it again. <laughs> but, but no, no. So that, uh, no, seriously, that, that uh, this idea, I, I think there is, there are, there are particulars, there, there are particular historic episodes that, that y you can look at predispositions, predictors or whatever. But in fact, what matters is that these things did happen in the way they did and what was most interesting is that a generation of university administrators did not see this coming. If ever there has been a group that was confident that they were in control of institutions and that they were the, what I call the masters of the university, as opposed to the masters of the universe, <laughs> it, it were the university presidents in the early 1960s. And they totally misread and misunderstood the viewpoints of a young generation coming through the system. 
So, so John, often people today bemoan the lack of activism among young people or civic engagement, right? And, you know, hearken back to memories of the 60s. Are, are people who complain about the current generation right? Or are we just sort of lucky not to have been subject to the draft nowadays? Or do you think we're just romanticizing and wrong about the 60s? I think you make a very good point about the draft. I do think having the military draft influenced many, many, possibly most American college students directly or indirectly. And I think the absence of a draft the last, say, 20 years is one explanation for the relative lack of spirited political discussion on campuses. However, I do think in the last 25 years or so, there has been a remarkable and underappreciated strand of student activism, and that is in philanthropy and in community service, and in commitment to civic organizations. And what I like about it is it is less confrontational and less violent than the rhetoric and polemics of, say, 50 years ago. So I think there was a spike in definite volatile student activism But I also think there are other forms of engagement that I find very, very encouraging. So what do you, when you say that there's other forms of activism, so if you said philanthropy, civic engagement, can you give us some examples of kind of what you had in mind? Well, I I recall I I was uh, on the faculty at Indiana University, 1993 through 96, and both undergraduates and graduate students there had taken the initiative where they pushed the faculty. It was... They wanted some academic credit and legitimacy for kinds of field work, extension, community service, working with nonprofit organizations. And they were very polite, but they were very organized and very informed. And I think very effective in that they really did transform the curriculum into being much more elastic and accommodating in the kinds of things that were considered. And and I think the term that they used was service learning. And I, I thought that was a, a healthy American compromise. The, the, the 1960s style of activism by student groups was often very, very self-righteous. And the, 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 the kind of gallows humor was whether someone demonstrating on the picket lines as a junior or senior in college, would they be willing to forfeit going on for their MBA or or their law degree? Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, so John, it's, it's, you know, popular kind of culture right now references all the time, the idea that we're, we're presently facing sort of unprecedented levels of polarization. And so my question is, you know, are we sort of forgetting how much more polarized it was in the 60s? Or would you say we're seeing a resurgence of what was seen before in the idea of you're with us or you're against us? Isn't polarization a, a version of that? And was it worse then, better then? How, how do you think about that? Well, I'm a bit like the mule caught equal distance between oats and water. And I can't <laughs> chew. I, 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 and I, so I die of hunger and thirst. But every... Every era, every You time. smell better than a mule. <laughs> Wait a while. We're not done yet. No. <laughs> that every generation or period obviously takes itself very seriously. It, 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 and the issues are very real. I think there have always been fractures. There have been you know, confrontations. There have been differences. I do think the differences politically in the United States today are pretty deep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I, I think that just by inertia, you gravitate toward your own experience. And then because we know how the past turned out, it, it, it holds less uncertainty for us. But I, I do think that the, the period that I think has been underestimated in terms of problems would be the late 1970s and early 1980s through all of American life, if you look at the condition of, let's say, a New York City that goes bankrupt or of the condition of metropolitan schools nationwide, of 10 years of double-digit inflation, of stagflation. So, so certainly every era will have its strengths and its weaknesses. So I'm not waffling. I'm just saying that 
the the upshot is each generation is going to if it thinks its its situation is unique okay it's going to have to face it on its own terms well that's good do you think there's anything that we can learn about sort of polarization in the 60s that can help us address this problem today I mentioned earlier that there was a generation or, of or, or how not to address it. I should say, yeah. what's that? Some, sometimes it's good to learn how or, not or how to not address. to address yeah. it. Yeah. I, I, I think th- I, I do think that college and university officials are more cognizant of undergraduate attitudes, preferences, and I, I think that in the 1960s there was an obliviousness of in which uh, adults in leadership roles were pretty obtuse in 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 heeding what the, their their daughters and sons were saying, and there, there's always a tendency adults could say, "Oh well, every generation goes through this ritualized descent; it, it too shall pass." Well, it's also true that it shall resurface, mm. and mm-hmm. so so that you 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 do have to play the game where where it's taking place, which is in the present, going toward the future. So interesting. So something about kind of listening to young people and paying attention to something. Yeah, but, but but notice notice I'm not I'm not uh, indicating what your response to that listening will be. That sure. that that's you know open to discussion. Indeed. Well, that's a great moment to say that we're going to come back after a short break with one more segment with Dr. John Thielen. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio, and you've been listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber. Today, having a really wonderful and insightful conversation with John Thielen about going to college in the 60s. I'm learning a, a tremendous amount uh, about this time period and kind of how it's, it, it, it really changed and shaped academic institutions. So in this final segment, we're going to ask John some final big picture questions. We're going to ask him whether or not he thinks Philosophy Bakes Bread Maybe we'll ask him about history too. History does history does bake history bread? bake bread, <laughs> uh, and we'll share some lighthearted thoughts, and then ask him for uh, a question for our listeners, and we'll go about our, our daily business. So, John, yeah, it, we, we were kind of kept talking about how you know, we had this overcrowding in the '60s. We had this big attitude change in the universities. This, are you with us or against us? How has society kind of been affected by the changes to higher education in the '60s and since? Like, even for someone who maybe isn't going into higher education, not concerned with it at all, what effect has it had upon American culture in general? One of the enduring legacies is that with the varieties of campus disruption, dissent. It was a landmark in that I think Congress and the American public had reasonable doubt as to whether colleges and universities could shape and operate and run themselves appropriately. There was was a a discernible loss of confidence, a a loss of innocence. Oh, Um, interesting. And and it it would be indicated graphically by such things as tapering of federal research funding votes of less or no confidence in university presidents. Mm. And, and, and the biggest the biggest change that that had little to do with the extreme politics was recognizing students as consumers. And that is why in 1972, with what would become Pell Grants and all the other massive federal student aid programs, you'll notice that the process was that federal money would go to students, not to institutions. And students would then vote with their feet on where they would take those federal grants or loans and where they would choose to enroll. And, and in some ways, that was a, a wake-up call to colleges and universities that students as members of the community and as consumers and as future voters were an important group and that institutions should no longer presume that they were to be recipients of all this generosity, and 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 look at look at the continued concern over declining state appropriations for higher education. Much of that is grounded in that loss of confidence that came about in the late 1960s and early 1970s. John, in in that's very interesting. In our discussion and leading up to this to this conversation we're having now, I I had asked you about you know to what extent 
the Cold War, the sort of scare, you know, that the Russians posed for the United States, the extent to which that, you know, might have been an inspiration for funding things like research and, and the uni- colleges and universities. And, and you know, th- that didn't seem to sort of uh, play a big role in your thinking. Am I wrong about that? Am I, mis- mis- am I misunderstanding you? Or, or how should we think about the role of the Cold War and the kind of competition with Russians and, and the possible influence that might have had on funding and, and kind of different attitudes about higher education. I, I think your observation is on the mark. There was a wonderful book that came out, oh, I think about 15 years ago by Rebecca Lowen, who is at UC San Diego. And it was called Creating the Cold War University. Uh-huh. And it was a wonderful case study of the transformation of Stanford that hmm. what pe- most people don't realize is that the chair of the board and the kind of icon of Stanford was Herbert Hoover. Huh. Maligned, maligned as a U.S. president in the Depression, but in fact, one of the true geniuses of the 20th century in terms of combining engineering with education and funding and philanthropy. And, and what Stanford did was it sensed that from World War II, the federal involvement in research and development was here to stay. And they were poised to take, for example, departments of physics, chemistry, engineering, and they tapped into the burgeoning federal research and development that came about starting in the early 50s. They were in the right place at the right time. And so that created the really superstar research university, which which actually developed the name, the Federal Grant University. Hmm. And so you would add right, you know, right. Stanford, Johns Hopkins, Berkeley, Michigan, MIT. There, there will be about 20 universities that received about 80% of federal research funding. Good night. That's amazing. And, and that's and that's 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 been distributed a bit, but but the the pattern still largely holds. So that that is a legacy of that Cold War era that that you mentioned. Interesting. What takeaways do you want people to think about with regard to going to college in the sixties? Any like sort of last big? Here's what here's what I want people to take away. As a historian, I try very much to always connect past and present, not in any simplistic or linear sense. I think that what strikes me is whether it be in 1965 or today, the family and parental anxiety about college admissions, college success, and then subsequent what after college, what strikes me is how central this has become to growing up in America. Mm. And, and, and certainly the, the daughters and, and sons are, are the main event. At the same time, it encompasses parents, elders of all sorts, employers. And it's, it's this kind of offhanded testimony to how important and appealing going to college is. And, and, and it's interesting. Uh, I, I was reading President Barack Obama's commentary about right. going to his, high, his daughter's high school graduation and the thought of her going away to college and how this kind of bittersweet, he was so happy for her and proud of her. And yet he said he he was just in tears at the thought of the change. So these transitions, we, we are a college, we are a nation of colleges. And and so so all the dissent and discussion and arguments over colleges are an offhanded testimony how important going to college is in the 60s and in the 21st century. And now. Important part of American culture. Indeed, that's good. Indeed. Well, uh, John, as you know, this is this is a, a show that generally, in, in the big picture, emphasizes philosophy. We have a b- pretty broad kind of understanding, and a lot of different people think about what that is differently. And so, we invite however you want to address this question. To, we're welcome to to it. But we, we we every episode ask our guest about the old saying that says that philosophy bakes no bread, right? There's a, there's a poet named Novalis who wrote that, you know, philosophy may bake no bread, but it can procure for us God, the soul and immortality, which then is more profitable philosophy or economy. Of course, the problem is everyone remembers the philosophy doesn't bake bread part, you know, <laughs> and he was trying to say something positive about philosophy. And, and so we like to you know, ask people, would you say that something like philosophy, which is, you know, one of the courses and subject matters you don't study in K-12 education usually, but you do in higher education, would you say that it bakes bread or that it doesn't? And, and, and why, how, show your work. Let me give two examples to respond to the, the, that indictment or allegation is that 
Today, we take for granted computers, computer science departments on, right. on virtually every university and many, many colleges. In the late 1960s, I don't believe any such departments existed. Hmm. And what I found working as a graduate student at, at an institute connected to University of California's Institute of Library Research is that philosophers were central to the team, usually joining with electrical engineers, mathematicians, and physicists. You know, that was kind of the big four. And they, they created computer science. So you can just look at that Venn diagram <laughs> to see the, the overlap. So, so the, the idea that, that a field such as philosophy is somehow peripheral or marginal, that's only if you have on blinders. Let, let me give another example. Here, uh, here. And by the way, I'm not like running for a provost or office. <laughs> uh, but uh, you no, no, a, a very good friend of mine, the late Thomas Dyer, professor of history and also had been at one time academic vice president at the University of Georgia. And he he tested out some of those claims about you know the 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 lack of uh, appeal of philosophy courses. In fact, what he found their enrollments are quite healthy, and that I I think there's there's some facile stereotyping by by any number of measures. And and once again, I I would go back into the Commonwealth of Kentucky's history. One of the the really bright young men of the New Deal was Ed Pritchard, who was from Bourbon County. And and FDR was grooming him for the Supreme Court and also liked him around because he was a court jester, because he was a very bright guy. Hmm. And he was later in a debate with William F. Buckley. And they're talking about what should be in a university and what should not. And so Pritchard would say when someone like from the state legislature would suggest, well, why don't we just do away with the philosophy department? And his answer was, you could do that but you would no longer have a real university. That's right. Yeah, here, here. That's good. <laughs> you know, we like that idea. <laughs> well, I mean, I wonder if, you know, you said there's some sort of backlash against philosophy and the sort of uh, looking at it fast. I wonder if it doesn't at least partly stem from this, the backlash against universities from the 60s. You kind what, of mentioned but, that but, already. But, but the back, I, I think what it's more like, like, you know, squeezing the, the balloon, you know, like if you, like that, that certain components or areas in the university at one time they're in favor another time you know they wax and wane and but but you gotcha. but what, what i really think though is is for an uninformed outside glancing shot to to say that that this is useful or this is not it's really very short-sighted and and i still say that your your genuine achievements often are predicated on a very solid sound liberal education. And there Amen. are so many, so many, so many examples of, of that. Indeed. Anthony, you want to tell some jokes? Yeah, let's do. Let's tell some jokes. As you know, John, we want people to know there's both a serious side and a lighter side to philosophy and history. And so we have this little next short segment we call Philosophunnies. Say, philosophunnies. Philosophunnies. <laughs> Who can Say, resist? Philosophunnies. Philosophunnies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, that's Eric's ridiculously cute son trying to say philosophy funny. So uh, we'd love to hear if you've got a favorite joke or a funny fact or a story about college in the 60s or about higher education or can you, you know, well, you, you're, you're a funny guy. Can much of our conversation giggle? today has been about the conflicts, the uh, contentiousness. Once in a while, there's some some landmark events that unexpectedly bring together disparate, even conflicting constituents. And what I remember at Berkeley in May 1970, in the aftermath of the very tragic and highly publicized Kent State activism and shootings, right. was that there was a, an amazing consensus that something was awry and that that the student dissidents did have a point. And this this spread across the map and across the terrain. And the the example that I recall now with good humor was that in the in the response to the shootings and the and the response to the overreaction of the governor of Ohio and the acting president of Kent State was to see fraternities and sororities for a while united with the counterculture and they joined in having car washes for peace. <laughs> <laughs> Only in America. Yeah, that doesn't sound like something you'd expect. 
car washes for peace. <laughs> ah, that is only in America. I love it. That's so good. You want to tell some of these jokes we, we, we stumbled across, Eric, and I always try to come up with one or two little, you know. That's right. And, and, I call actually, them dead, dead jokes, one-liners. Yeah, a- Anthony found a couple that were jokes from the 60s, actually, that that, that aren't horribly offensive, I, I hope. Yeah, right. We can credit these is, to is Robert, he, is gonna, is, Robert Is he, is he, is he going to uh, hit me with them? I think he's going to hit you with one of them. All yeah. right. Let's, okay. Let's All right. right. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this sitting down. <laughs> Literally <laughs> about the sixties. <60s. laughs> All right, so what did we say? These are from these are from Robert Orban. Uh, we can give credit where credits due here. So he says, "I love the way they keep stressing low yield atomic bombs. That's the military version of being a little bit pregnant." That goes by me. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. All right, N- no good on that one. No good. We're, we're, you know, this is a sixties joke. Evidently, we're going to spend thirty billion dollars to find out if there's any intelligent life on Mars. Of course, there's intelligent life on Mars. You can tell by the fact that they're not spending thirty billion dollars to find out about us. Okay, okay, a little, a little very bit, good, a little bit. <laughs> hey, hey, if you're not funding for us, you're funding against us. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, if you don't like those jokes, blame them on the sixties. That's, right. that's, what, that's what you get. <laughs> Last but not least, we do like to take advantage of the fact that today we have powerful social media that allow for two-way communications, even for programs like radio shows. So we want to invite our listeners to send us their thoughts about big questions that we raise on the show. That's right. Given that, we'd love to hear your thoughts, John, about what question you think we should ask our listeners for future segments that we call, You Tell Me. Have you got a question to pose for our listeners? Well, I'd like to know about what's the relationship between higher education and jobs. Ah. There, that's, that's the puzzle that, that I've been you know, sorting through, and I, I, I cannot find a good single answer. And that boy, I sure would like to hear from, from our undergraduates and recent alums on that. That's a really good question. What's the relationship between higher education well, and jobs? Let's, huh? let's, let, all right, let, let's take some of our, our icons of innovation, Stephen Jobs. Bill Gates. I never met a dropout I didn't like. <laughs> right. So, I mean, the, 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 the point is, there is an amazing array of talent. Some of it is credentialed, some of it is not. And I, I, I think we go back to the, the dissing on philosophy. Uh, I, I think that's one of the most short-sighted and wrong-headed approaches that is, is I think, a recipe for lack of vision. Here, here. All right. Well, I, I have actually have a lot more to say to this, but I think we're running out of time. So I want to thank you for joining us today, John. We've had a really thank wonderful so conversation. Much. I've it, learned it, a bunch. This has been, been uh, a wonderful uh, invitation from you, Anthony, and, and from Eric. It's thank been you. our pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I hope our listeners have enjoyed listening to this episode of Philosophy Baked Spread. And we hope you'll respond to us with questions you've the, the show has raised to you about the specific question that John just raised for you. What is that relationship between higher end and jobs? Remember, folks, that you can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our website at philosophybakesbread.com. And there you'll find transcripts for many of our episodes. And one more thing, folks, if you want to support the show and to be more involved in the work of the Society of Philosophers in America, SOFIA, the easiest thing to do is to go check us out and consider joining as a member at philosophersinamerica.com. If you're enjoying the show, and we hope that you are, maybe and you're listening to us on a podcast today, maybe you could take a quick second to rate and review us on your uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to us today. Also, take a quick second to check out John's book, Going to College in Indeed. the 60s. It's, if you like today's conversation, I think you'll really enjoy the book. You can, of course, email us at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. And you can also call us and leave a short recorded message with a question or a comment that we may be able to play on the show. And you can reach us at 859-257-1849. That's 859-257-1849. Your hosts have been Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber, and we've been with John Thielen today having an awesome conversation, and I hope you join us again next time on Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream. 
at WRFL.FM, and of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the Central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.